Good evening, and welcome to another episode of Off the Deep End with Sean. Uh, I am your host, Sean Murdoch, and um, tonight I want to talk to you about possibly the craziest single idea that I have, but it makes sense. And I think that it solves a lot of problems, it answers a lot of questions, but I'm not a physicist. I'm not a quantum anythingist. I'm not an anythingist. But I have an idea of what light is and what gravity is and how the two of them work together and how they're interrelated with time. Yeah. So strap on your thinking caps because this is about to get heavy. Be back in a minute. Bye. Hey, it's me. Uh, first, before I get started on that, I want to mention something that if you're around, if you're new to the podcast, I've got a couple different series going on. One is this one called uh, Off the Deep End, where I just take some of my crazier ideas and philosophies and thoughts and just no holds barred fringe science, um, metaphysics, all the really wacky stuff, and kind of laid it out, laid it out there for you. And um. Some of it is here just completely um, self-indulgent, and some of it ties into my other podcasts, uh, my ongoing series called Boring Dad Lectures. And in the Boring Dad Lectures, I talk about things that I wish I would have known when I was younger. I wish that I could have taught my children better or talked to them about, and things that I think help with... Um, moving towards a better society and a more tolerant, stable, loving world. And uh, it's all those kinds of ideas. But um, yeah, I call it uh, Boring Dad Lectures because guess what? I'm a middle-aged white guy. I'm your favorite dude that you'll ever meet with khaki cargo pants and, and ASIC sneakers and a short sleeve plaid button down shirt and a little bit of a pot belly and um i look like i used to be in pretty good shape because it was <laughs> so anyway check out that podcast too and or on my website you can uh find me at uh, sean murdoch talks.com that's s-e-a-n-m-u-r-d-o-c-k-t-a-l-k-s.com and um or And I've got links on there to my uh, Twitter feed and Facebook. And you can also get this podcast any place where fine podcasts are available. So I'll talk to you in a minute. Let's get going on this thing. It's going to get heavy. Bye. Okay, so I'm going to get started on this. Um, So this is an idea that I had. I was kind of like in a flash. Um, Like, I don't know, like most ideas come to people, you know, when you're just kind of sitting around and pondering and then all of a sudden, you know, things just kind of start to make sense. And at the time I'd been studying a lot of different things. I've been studying um, physics. I've been looking at quantum physics. I've been looking at um, the nature of reality. I'd I'd read um, Einstein's theory of relativity. I'd read some stuff by um, Brian Greene. Um, And I was also into this kind of fringe science guy who studies uh, consciousness named uh, Tom Campbell. And I was getting a lot, and he's a, he's a theoretical physicist and who ended up studying consciousness. And it was just a combination of all those sorts of things. And it was also a period when I was doing a lot of long walks and listening to audiobooks and then just also not doing anything. I was just wandering around the woods of Missouri and I kind of had this aha moment oh there's one other guy that I listened to a lot I looked at a lot of his work and he's another kind of fringe science scientist and his name is uh, Nassim Haramain and he's one of these guys that is so far out there him and Tom Campbell the work that they do is so far out there that mainstream uh, physicists don't even give them the time of day. 
you know, but I'm not a mainstream physicist. So I listened to the things that they had to say and I looked at some of their work and not being a physicist, you know, being a complete layman, um, it started to kind of congeal. And one day I sort of had this aha moment and then I did some research and which I'll talk about. And I, um, found out that my idea was an old idea, but it's, but I think that the old idea could have used some Nassim Haramain thrown into it. So let me get going. The big, the big question that a lot of, um, scientists have when it comes to gravity is they don't really understand what it is. It's one of these things where they know how it works. They know that it works. They, they can measure every single thing about it. And there are a few ideas about what it is, but it's really difficult for them to, you know, put their finger on what, what makes it happen. And I think, I think my idea um, is a step in the right direction, maybe. And I think it has something to do with light, which sounds completely strange. It sounds like, you know, I'm, I'm blending in two different things that are um, just mutually exclusive. But I think that they're the same thing. I My idea is that you can't, gravity wouldn't exist if it wasn't for light. Yeah, light would exist, but gravity could not exist without light. And I'm, the, the first thing I want to do is to express that I'm not talking about only light in the visible spectrum. I'm talking about light in the infinite spectrum. Because you have to assume that light falls on an infinite spectrum. We have, you know, we can see, and then there's light outside of our visible range. We've got ultraviolet and... um infrared and you know and then and then light beyond that too and it's possible that there's light beyond that that we can't even measure we can't conceive of and i think it is light within that entire continuum is what i'm talking about and and i think that the sun for example emits more light than just you know what we can see and what we can measure it um I'm sure there's people out there with degrees who could tell you a lot more about this, but that's I'm I'm looking at it on a, on a much broader spectrum than just visible light. So keep that in mind. So the aha moment that I had was I was I was learning about the Planck length, Planck length, and essentially a Planck length is let me see if I can explain this essentially is, is the smallest divisible unit that we've, um, sort of come up with. And it's the, the, the distance that light travels in a second. So you can imagine that that's really, really tiny. And that's, you know, things are, that's down on the, on the quantum level where things are just unimaginably small. So, Take those two ideas. So take this concept of the, the Planck length and then take the concept of light as it's, you know, kind of traveling around doing its thing. Have you guys, have you guys seen that camera that actually films at the speed of light and they can fire a, an individual proton past this camera and it, well, well, it's not at the speed of light, but it's close to it. And they can film... Um, a single proton. There's a you can look it up on on um, YouTube. But there's a video where it travels through a, a bottle of water, and you can see this this proton is sort of lighting up as it's get, you know traveling through this bottle of water, and you can see the course that it takes and how it you know kind of refracts and bends a little bit and then carries on its way. And um, it's just it's mesmerizing. But that video came out after I'd already come up with this theory and it, well, hypothesis, I guess. And it definitely plays to what I'm talking about. I think that it, it demonstrates pretty clearly what it is that I'm trying to express. 
So if you if you got a sec, go check out that video. Um, I may like later on. I'll probably put a, a, a link to it in here. So my hypothesis is that there is a substance which Einstein came to call space time, and he had an example of well, the way that he describes space time is if if you've ever seen the thing where he, where he talks about um gravity and talks about um like a like a bowling ball on a bed sheet right if you take a like a, a bed sheet and you make it so it's really tight and then you put a bowling ball in the middle of it and then you take um and then it it causes like this depression in the sheet and then you could take a marble and spin it around the bowling ball and it would follow the the course of that bowling ball it would stick relatively close to the edge of that you know so if you rolled it past it it would like zoom in close to it and then go off in another direction and if you were able to, if you just do a thought experiment where you say well there's no friction then it would theoretically just you know get into that loop around the bowling ball and just continue around it indefinitely and probably eventually start to you know creep in towards the bowling ball and those are the sorts of things that we see happening with gravity but the problem with that that i see is that space isn't two-dimensional so that that works on a two-dimensional level but it doesn't work on a three-dimensional level or any other dimensional level and so I, I was wondering about that, like how could something like that work in three-dimensional space? And the idea that I came up with was that there must be a fundamental element within space-time where the... Um, and uh, Tom Campbell talks a little bit about this too, about how... Uh, light refreshes on at the at the plank length so that everything remains at a, at a constant he goes way in, in depth on this but the way he describes it as kind of like a like a pixel like the pixels on your screen so when you're watching something moving on your computer monitor if you zoom in close enough you can see like individual pixels and they're you know red green and blue and they change their shades and and in certain ways so that you can see the colors that are rendered on your screen. And that's the old technology. We've had that for a long, long time. But Tom Campbell's theory is that everything in the seeable universe works on that level of reality. And uh, he, he's a big advocate of the um, holographic universe. That's another great book to read, too, The Holographic Universe. It's, um, it's, a, it's a brain bender, too. So... I kind of took those two ideas and put them together where I thought, well, what if Tom Campbell's idea is right and everything does kind of happen on a pixelated level at the at a at a quantum distance at the Planck length? And what if Einstein's theory is right? But then how could you use those two things at in a three dimensional sense? How would that work? And I thought, well, if you have a if you if you have the smallest possible unit right and it's a it's a sort of a, a fabricy thing but it's three dimensional and it's all it's all around us in all ways but at the smallest possible level at that plank length it's made up of individual units like pixels on a screen say right and I thought that was a really cool idea. And so I did some research on that. And I found out that a, a scientist back in the 1930s, I think, came up with an idea of quantum foam. And the way that he described it was almost exactly what I was talking about. This, this concept of a quantum foam, that things happen within this. And it's a foam because you can see like the little tiny bubbles in it, but the bubbles are at the quantum level. And all the things are happening in there all the time. You know, when you get into string theory and quarks and protons and electrons and all that kind of stuff is happening down within that space. And they're happening within this sort of quantum foam. 
But the problem they ran into with that is that it lent itself to uh, inconsistency. Because if you have something that that's, that's small and it's just a bunch of, you know, you picture like um, when you when your kids go to like the play place and they've got that pool that's full of like the little plastic balls and they fall into it and the balls are just kind of like rolling over each other everywhere and, you know, everything kind of gets all mixed up and crazy all over the place. And that became the idea that this quantum foam is this crazy mixed up thing and that's always kind of in flux and always moving and it's always being influenced, you know, and, um, so it didn't work well for my idea of what, um, what gravity would do. And then I came across the work of Nassim Harami and Nassim is very interested in how things spin and the effects of things that spin and he he says that you know everything is spinning at all levels like all from the from the highest um parts of the the universes and the galaxies and the planets and the stars all the way down to the atomic level and the protons and the neutrons and electrons and everything is spinning all the time so i thought if everything else is spinning, then maybe this quantum foam is also spinning. And maybe there's something about this quantum foam that when it spins, it produces a positive and a negative charge. So you have almost a miniature Earth that has a North Pole and a South Pole, has a, 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 a magnetic poles to itself. And because it's spinning. And if that were the case, then it would all be interlocked. You know, it would, it would create a three-dimensional grid. So, so if you imagine, if you take some... Um, some steel balls that are magnetized, you know, and you lump them all together, you can make a square, you can make a cube, rather, of magnetized steel balls that are all just stuck together in a block, you know, and then if you take that and you imagine it out to infinity, or let's just say, you know, a thousand miles for now, but then you take each, each of those steel balls and you shrink them down so that they are the size of a single plunk length, right? And they're not a steel, you know, they're just energy potentials. They or they are um, vacuum potentials, maybe. Or you could say that they are a um, potential carriers or capacitors, not, not capacitors, but maybe uh, conductors. They're, they're infinitely conductive, you know, because they're at that scale. But they're all interlocked, and it forms this grid, right? Or a, like a grid, a cubed grid of infinite space of these plunk length magnetized steel balls that aren't steel. They're actually <laughs> empty. But they're they're charged in a way that they will draw um energy through them and they'll allow energy to pass through them and that's the important thing so here's where light starts to come in so we know that when a light when a photon travels we know that it can be influenced by gravity right we know that we can see a star that we know is behind the sun because the light traveling from that star will travel around the sun so that we can see it. Even though it's physically behind the sun, we can still see it because the light from that star will travel around the sun. So here's my idea. 
when oh okay and then okay so going back to the video of the single photon that was traveling they, they filmed it with the camera that you know films at almost the speed of light and they could track this individual photon as it was traveling the way that i had pictured it before i came up with this idea is that it was like a like a particle it was like a thing that would would move but then as you're watching this photon travel you can see that at different places there's little bursts of light that kind of go in different directions even though you know it's only one photon there's like these little energy signatures that kind of travel out from it in, in different directions all, all the way through as it as it's moving and that's interesting okay so let me back up and tell you one more thing there's this thing called the double slit experiment and whereby they can take a single photon and they set up these two slits in a board and if they fire a single photon through one of the slits this thing gets it gets kind of crazy but basically that's where they started to get the, the the idea that light behaves as both a particle and a wave so you can do the experiment one way so that a single photon will go through a single slot and appear at a single point on a wall and it's just that one thing that goes right through there but then you can take a photon and fire it and it'll go through those it'll go through both slots in the wall and it will create a wave pattern and that's something that's had physicists stumped for a long time is trying to figure out why light behaves as both a particle and a wave now if you've listened to my sean the, the um boring dad lectures series i did one in there about um duality versus non-duality and it's really important because this is something else that where duality and non-duality applies because light behaves like both a particle and a wave because it is both a particle and a wave so you have to understand it's not an either or thing it's a it's a both and thing okay so all those ideas together nassim haramein things that spin positive and negative charges the, the magnetic balls that are all stuck together but at the quantum level the light that travels but then ever as it's traveling through it lets off these little weird emissions all over the place and light that travels around the sun you know it, it, it follows the course of the gravity around the planet if you will so take all those things together and here's my idea is that what gravity is is light it's the it's the effect of the light as it travels through the quantum foam because as it passes through it is it's radiating its own energy as it's going through this quantum foam and as it does that it temporarily increases or changes the charge of the individual quantum foam uh, units as it goes through and as it does that it excites them and they tend to separate apart a little bit as this energy is going through it puts tension and stress onto the that quantum foam and makes them want to draw apart from each other and then once it's gone then they draw back together again my idea is that as that's going through and it's creating that tension then anything else that's going to be close to it will be drawn towards that vacuum it's creating a little miniature vacuum that pulls other things into it and that is the that's the gravitational force so now you have to take this and kind of expand it out to a, a larger a larger set a larger idea and the the idea is that at the at a fundamental level everything everything is light 
I'm not going to unpack that. Uh, I don't understand it well. It's something that I've I've read a couple times, but everything is fundamentally comes from light. Even matter comes from light. And th- there's a lot of debate about that. And like I said, I don't fully understand it, but I think that there is truth to it. It's, I don't know. It just, it feels true for some reason. I mean, if you look back through the creation myths, then it's very common that the first thing that was created, well, the first thing that was created was thought. And I think that's interesting. I'm not sure how that all plays into this at this point. I have a fairly good idea, but I haven't pondered it for a while. But the next thing that was created was light. And then everything else kind of blossomed out of that. And I, and I think the reason is that as light travels through the quantum foam, it starts to create gravitational pulls. And it can then start to produce reactions within... Um, it can start to create atoms, if you will. It'll start to create individual atoms, which will start to then group together. And then those individual atoms will group together with other individual atoms. You know, as the light is passing through it, it just, it kind of creates this natural tension and creates different little energy signal signatures. And as it's going through, then, you know, some different energy signatures start to spin and those are things that are happening on the atomic level. It's sort of like their momentum as it's going through spins this thing. And it starts to do that. And then they start to to congeal and pile together. You know, and before long you've got a speck of dust. And before long those specks of dust meet other specks of dust. And then they start to accumulate and pile up. And next thing you know you have the earth. Right? That's interesting. So... And then, but then anything that has any kind of mass to it also interacts with this same field because it then becomes a, a dense object, which is full, which is completely densely packed with atomic energy, with things that are happening at the atomic level. And you've got all this spinning and turning and all this kind of stuff. So when all that energy is happening, all those vibrations are are happening, then the quantum foam gets excited at that level and anything else that's close to it gets drawn to it. You know, and if it's made of different types of atoms that can't intertwine or can't intermix, then, you know, I mean, you maybe know that um, no two things ever actually touch you know, at the, at the smallest possible level, there's a, there's an energy resistance there. So even though you can feel like your hands touching each other, or you can feel, you know, a car smash into you, technically the car never really touched you. It never actually touched you at the quantum level. And it's the same sort of thing. Like when you're walking on the earth, when you're stuck to the earth, that the, the energy radiating from all the atomic mass of the earth is creating excitement within that quantum foam and then drawing you back down to it. Yeah. And that's why as you start to get further away from the earth, the gravity decreases because you're, you're breaking away from the the excitement at the atomic level that is interrupting the the positive and negative uh, charge within the quantum foam and then you know as you get further away it starts to lessen you know but then the larger an object is the more impact it has like the the broader the excitation gets within the quantum foam and that's why the moon stays in the earth's orbit and why the earth stays in the sun's orbit and why we stay within the Milky Way galaxy's orbit. And that only took me 29 minutes. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. So that's what I think. I think that gravity is a product of light 
and it's because of the way that light interacts with the quantum foam. And I think that quantum foam is a rigidly interlocked fabric of three-dimensional uh, energy, potential energy receptors, which are positive and negatively charged and uh, carry on throughout all of infinity. Yeah. That's what I think. Now, what about time? I talked about time, too. So, time, then, would be... Okay. So, the way that I explained all this would assume that this quantum foam was rigid and stationary. Now, I do think that it is rigid on the micro scale, but when I say micro scale, I mean within, I don't know if there's a distance for this, but to, to me, um, 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 when you're talking on the universal level, a micro scale would be like a light year, you know, like one, a single light year on a universal scale is microscopic, you know? So I think that it is effectively stationary for our conceivable perception, you know, that, you know, w within a cubic light year, there's no perceptible movement with that. But if you extend that out to millions and billions of light years, then, you know, one end of it's going to be further ahead and one of it's going to be further behind and some of it's going to be excited at different levels and it's going to, you know, at, at the, the million light year scale, there's going to be some flow and differential in that, you know. And that's where, I think it was Brian Green was talking about that, about how, you know, we could be, this is one of the puzzles they were trying to figure out and I think this is something that this, my solution addresses this, is that, Nobody is, nobody in the universe is traveling at the same speed, at the same rate. You know, there's other people that are traveling faster than us, you know, so you may have, so if you picture, I think this is Einstein's theory, if you picture time as like a loaf of bread, you know, you want to, as you know, and you want to be able to think that any individual slice of time, like right now, is sliced and it's perpendicular along that slice of bread, you know, and that an alien on a planet, you know, 50 million light years away is experiencing time at the same rate that we are. But the reality is that it could be sliced at a diagonal. So, and if it's sliced at a diagonal and you expand, extend that out 30 million light years, then that alien could be millions and millions of years in our future even though we're on the same slice of time. Does that make sense? That's another tough one. Look up the video on that one too. But, so I think that the way that time works with that is that this, this whole mass is, and you can't really call it a mass because it's almost like a non-mass. It's almost like the dark matter. Like this, this is what dark matter is, is this quantum foam. And, but it is the thing into which the big bang banged bigly <laughs> to use a Trumpism. <laughs> yeah. It's the, the quantum foam is the reality. It's the sound stage, if you will. It's the ocean that's moving and, and flowing, but on such an unimaginably large scale that where we are, even within the confines of our galaxy and neighboring galaxies and neighboring stars, that we couldn't notice any kind of difference in it. Does that make sense? But at the same time, it is still moving. It's, it's progressing along the way, just like the, like a current's in the ocean, you know, like the, like the Gulf stream is moving, you know, and if you're an amoeba, you know, if you're plankton in the ocean and you get sucked into the, to the Gulf stream and you're being pulled north, you have no idea what's going on. 
And I think that's where we are is, you know, we're being pulled along through this. And that's what gives us the sensation of movement and of time. But it's also why the only time that you have is the now. It's the, it's the immediate moment, you know? So I think, I think that those, that's how those three things are interrelated. I think that it all comes from light. I think matter comes from light. Gravity is caused directly by light. And I think that they, but I think the movement of light through the quantum foam is what causes it to move and therefore initiates what we think of as time. Ta-da! <laughs> you can tell me I'm crazy later. I might be. And you know what? I don't even smoke weed. I came up with all this shit when I was still in the military. Anyway, I'm um, quite curious about your feedback. I'm going to listen to this a few more times and um, see how nuts it sounds. But, um, you know, if you come across this and you know a physicist or if you know of a stoner or <laughs> anybody, I've tried to present this to some physicists and um, all of them, I probably a dozen, probably over the last few years, you know, I've written this up and I've, I've emailed it to physicists, but... Any self-respecting physicist has a, a standard inbox for wacky ideas that aren't going to go anywhere. And I think mine just goes straight into the bin. <laughs> so thank God for technology so you all can listen to my crazy nonsense. So anyway, um, I think it's worth pondering. I think it's worth um, looking at. I think it's worth researching, um, poking a hole in it. i am definitely try that see what happens, but I don't ever hear anybody else talking about this. So I want to put this idea out there and say, Hey, maybe, maybe this has something to do with it. Maybe we can start to understand this because if it's, if it's true, even if it's a little bit true, or even if it can open up a door for somebody to start to think about things differently, then this idea, um, could open up uh, space travel. You know, it could open up um, like long distance space travel, if we can understand what this stuff is and how it works, we could start to understand how to pull energy from it, which is one of the things I think that, um, oh, who is the guy who, the guy with the, the electrician and Elon Musk started his company and it's called the Tesla, the Tesla. I think this is one of the things that Tesla was on to that, that he had seen this and where he had decided where he had found ways to pull energy uh, from the environment and I think if we can start doing this then this could be this could be a big idea in the future going forward of course this is so clunky it's not refined it's not beautiful but I think that the fundamental parts of it start to answer a lot of the big questions now I didn't talk about consciousness I didn't talk about observation and I think that consciousness plays a part in it but um, I'm still not sure entirely sure what consciousness is so I'm not even gonna go down that road right now anyway I am gonna let you go so love you much uh, thanks for sticking around I hope I didn't bend your brain too much and <laughs> I'll talk to you soon bye Hey, thanks for listening. Thanks for um, toughing it out. I know even as I was talking about that, I kept thinking, man, there's so many different things to, to unpack. And this is only meant to be like a, a Cliff Notes version to maybe whet somebody's appetite to, you know, get them to come back for maybe some other deep thoughts from Sean's world or, um, you know, get some conversations going. So if you like that, like I said in the beginning, you can reach out to me at my pod, my website rather at Sean Murdoch talks.com. That's S E A N M U R D O C K T A L K S.com. Check me out over there. Uh, I've got my links to social media stuff. And as I said, this podcast is available um, anywhere where fine podcasts are available. It's hosted through Podbean. And um, yeah, so that's pretty cool. Also, I have a, a Patreon page where I'm trying to raise some funds uh, for this so I can upgrade some equipment and take care of some other sorts of things and all that stuff. So 
If you think what I'm doing is worthwhile and you'd like to contribute to it, please do so. There's links to that on my website. Also, please know that if you do uh, contribute anything through Patreon, that I take uh, 10% right off the top and it goes to uh, World Vision. Uh, it's an organization I have supported for years and years and uh, they do fantastic work. And the m what I contribute to is their program where they give uh, micro loans to women in developing countries. And uh, I, m I might just do like a whole um, podcast on why I think that's important. But what ends up happening with these women is that they use the money to start small businesses and they um, generate they generate income, they increase the amount of income in their communities and they tend to educate their children and get educated themselves. And it's the educated children who are the ones who can change the world. You know, it's their, those are the ones who are going to take initiatives, initiatives to thwart global change. And they are going to be the ones to change their governments and the ones that are going to make lasting change in the world. So if you do decide to uh, support me and this podcast and the work that I'm doing, especially if you like the the, what, the work that I'm doing with my um, Boring Dad Lectures series, then um, you'll also be helping to make the world a better place. You know, every little helps. And um, so on that note, I love you guys much and I hope you're doing well. I hope you had a good and productive and healthy day and that you made somebody else around you have a better day and that you were able to form some new little habit that'll that'll make your world just a little bit better than it was before and um that you can keep paying it forward and being awesome so i'll talk to you soon